Good morning, everyone. This is Johanna here from the Improvement Service. Welcome to today's webinar. Today we have John Rogers um, from Wiltshire Council, and he's going to do a presentation on using systems thinking in Wiltshire Council's digital program. Um, before I'm going to hand over to John, I will just quickly run through the format of today's webinar. The webinar will take around 30 minutes, and after that, we, there will be time for questions. If you do have any questions to John, please send them through the, the question chat um, at any time during the presentation. I will moderate and present the questions to John afterwards. The session is recorded and the recording and the slides will be available online after the session. We will send out a link to the YouTube and the K-Hub where you can access all the material. After the webinar, you will also be sent a short survey about the webinar. Uh, we would be very thankful if you do have a minute to fill that in. With that said, I will now hand over to John. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Rogers, and I'm Head of System Thinking Customer Access at Wiltshire Council, where I've been running a fairly large team of systems thinking practitioners for the last seven years, and uh, where we've been using system thinking for about 10. And digital is relatively new. Uh, and of course, as our improvement methodology, we asked ourselves the question, what's the best way to uh, go about this and, and to apply system thinking principles to uh, using digital. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through the slides and then look forward to discussion afterwards. What do we mean by it? I'm going to just give you a little bit of background to give you some context, uh, not more, more for clarity of understanding than anything else. Uh, so good information and good sense. Design everything around customer purpose deliver maximum value across the system. And as a system, that means we work with our partners in multi-service and multi-agency work all the time. Naturally, we're looking for root causes so we can find the cause of demand and presentation and use that to improve the effectiveness and prevent. Uh, and as we work more and more in people-based services, that gets harder and harder. We do have two horizons. We have what we call better for now and right for the future. And we're happy for those to run in parallel. Anything that's better is better. And I suppose the other ingredient is lots of good humor and patience. It, you'll be familiar with this as a, a thing, but actually not everything works first time or even straightforwardly, I found. A bit about Wiltshire. Large rural authority, geographically large, uh, takes about an hour to drive across by car and two hours from top to bottom. About half a million people. We have only one sizable town and the rest are market towns. Uh, we've got a large military garrison of around 20,000 people and enormous amounts of Wiltshire are either Salisbury Plain or designated uh, AONB. Transport's OK East-West, uh, lots of employment, but big multiples between uh, earnings and uh, house prices. Uh, good schools, good results, but no university. So that's a bit about the context that we're working in. And it's fair to say good, generally good relationships between the partners and a constructive approach. When it comes to digital, it seems like, how could you possibly go wrong? Uh, almost anything you touch with digital is surely going to make it better. And we have a lot of people uh, calling. And, and if you like, if you're holding the gun, you've got everyone y yanking on your arm saying, no, no, do this one first, do this one, do, do this one. And then eventually people say, look, just pull the trigger. You're going to hit something. So, so what could possibly go wrong? What things could possibly go wrong? It's possible, isn't it, to, to burn quite a lot of money. Um, and not necessarily achieve the returns you're expecting. And I recognize that digital is iterative and a learning process, but even so, it would be quite handy to have a good evidence base on which to make your decisions. And we established that in the, by doing a, a large scale baseline. The baseline took around about four to five months work. So not enormous, it wasn't trivial, but it wasn't enormous either. A bit about our customers. As I said, we have around a half a million customers. Around about 90% of those really only call on our universal services. That's all the stuff that you'd expect. And then around about 10% uh, call on what we also call our safety net services as well. Um, and they account for around about 6% of the revenue spend in total uh, of, our, of our overall uh, budget. So that gives you some, some, some overall numbers and some kind of sense of proportion. So the first thing I wanted to show you was a customer contact demand heat map. And here we did a, a pretty quick, uh, not particularly detailed analysis, and we just counted transactions and we counted them by service and by channel. 
and then we mapped them out. And the, the, the larger the number, the hotter it was. That just told us this is where we've got large volumes of stuff going through. It didn't give us uh, answers, but it did tell us where to look in a bit more detail. Uh, this we had to stitch together from a variety of different systems and some demand capture and validation. But that was the first stage, the heat map. Um, we then actually did an awful lot of detailed analysis. And I, I'm happy to send you the dash, what we call dashboard. It's now at version 10, uh, where we didn't just analyze the demand, uh, but we also analyzed which of these transactions were operationally automated end to end. Which of them had, had manual handoffs? What were the end-to-end -end times? What were the steps in the process and which were manual and which were automated? And where were the IT systems involved? Which IT systems did this transaction flow through, even if it was mediated by a person? So that gave us a, a lot of really detailed information about where the, where, where, where's the money going? Where are the transactions? Where is the likely demand from customers going to be for us to do something different? Um, we. When we analyzed uh, the, the, the two and a half million transactions, which is the total number in the scope at this point, um, we then counted the steps and we differentiated them by channel. So as you can see, uh, phone interactions were 984,000 and typically involve 16 process steps, whereas web, 871, typically involve four steps, face-to-face -face 13 steps, and email six steps. Worthwhile pointing out that 950,000 of these transactions were already on digital channels. So the we definitely had a customer base who were really keen to use digital. And whatever, in fact, what we found is if we've offered anything good online, it's been taken up really rapidly and very successfully. So if we provide something good, they definitely use it. Um, one of the things we did was ask ourselves a question, what's, what kind of range of quality of, of service are we achieving through our, uh, through our, our transactions? And uh, we found that in, when things were done really, really well, you could have a one-step process with no handoffs and immediate end-to-end -end time. And an example of that would be the renewal of a parking permit for a residential parking, which is fully online. And it's a one-step process. Their customer goes in and does it, and that's that. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, one of our transactions could take a month and could involve 100 steps and five handoffs. So that, that, that raised some interesting questions about the design of the service underlying that, um, and in fact, whether there were some bigger challenges in simply automating it. We don't want to automate, just automate the way the process currently works. We think there's a, a step before that. I'm sure you, you've, you've all uh, familiar with the idea. You design it first for the best it can be and then automate that as far as you possibly can. So we then took, took our top eight services and tried to understand the extent to which they're currently automated, because this gave us a view on current opportunity. So this is rather a busy diagram. Uh, but if you started around about 11 o'clock, you'll see there's Leisure there. Um, leisure was the largest single, uh, second largest group of transactions at 900 and nearly 920,000. Zero automation. So you couldn't do, you couldn't actually do anything online uh, through leisure. So that was obviously a, an area which deserved considerable attention. And in fact, that program is, is, is being run by leisure and is due to go live with quite a lot of uh, online stuff in the not too distant future. Libraries, on the other hand, was reasonably automated, 57%. Interestingly, one, one of the highest areas of non-automated was people trying to book their next session to work at a library computer. So that's an interesting one to solve. And we haven't, haven't cracked it yet, but we, we note that. Um, council tax, around about 1 o'clock, uh, is, an, again, an interesting area. Zero automation, large numbers of transactions. And when you combine that with housing benefit, uh, around about 7 o'clock, there's another 120,000 there. And quite a lot of overlap between the clients of the services. Parking, highly automated. Housing options, again, quite a challenging service to automate. So although large numbers of transactions, not quite so straightforward. And then waste, interesting, very low automation there when you look at it end to end, even though there's quite a lot of web and phone transactions, uh, sorry, web and email transactions as, your, as part of your total, particularly web. So my question there would be, why isn't it going all the way through end to end? What is it that's stopping us from making that a fully automated service? 
Here's another slice through uh, typical transactions showing which ones are automated and which ones aren't. So left-hand side, all, all nice, happy, smiley faces. Right-hand side, less happy, smiley faces. When we asked ourselves the question, looking at electoral services, that's been big on everyone's agenda this year, what was the commonest transaction uh, in electoral service? It was confirming whether or not people were on the electoral register. And that's that one there. So again, this started to give us really helpful insights into ways to discuss with the different service areas the benefits that they could achieve for themselves and for customers by looking at automation. In terms of developing an overall business case, uh, if you think back to the um, transaction analysis that showed the different steps by channel, the bar chart, uh, on average, our current process steps for demand that is arriving already by digital transactions is five, five steps. Our best in class are one or two. So the best that you can achieve in practical, purpose, for practical purposes is let's call it one and a half. So the prize available for pe people who are already contacting us on digital channels is roughly three and a half process steps per transaction. And that's round about three and a half times 940,000. So around about three to three and a half million process steps are available for automation from transactions where people are already approaching us on digital channels. So no need to do channel shift, just make the, just the existing channel access work well on an automated way. And another 24 million process steps are available through channel shift as well as redesign. So a potentially really large prize there. Um, we reckon that uh, one member of staff does roughly a thousand hours, act, you know, real work a, a year in terms of delivery. When you factor in all their ho you know, holiday sick, team meetings, training development, and so on, um, and a fairly large proportion of our four and a half thousand staff spend most of their time manipulating data. So that's another way of looking at that equation: is how many hours of data processing um, are you removing from the organisation by automation? So that, that gives you the overall to the high level business case. And we'll get into a bit more detail about investment into specific areas later on. How do you get at those benefits? Well, I think we think it's really important to understand the customer transaction. That is typically not how we have defined it. So you do need to listen to the customer and work out what it is they're trying to do. What is their purpose? And where does this transaction fit in their universe? Redesign for value. You only want value steps automate where possible. You still have to be pragmatic and some of that will become clear as we go on through the next few slides. Uh, we don't operate in an unconstrained world, so we have to think about sequencing, about procurement contracts, about renewals, about a whole heap of things when we're actually making decisions. But we are looking for a mixture of returns. We're looking for quick returns as well as large returns. As we are aiming to have an overall self-funded self-funding program. So prime the pump and then the returns from the program fund the next levels of, of iteration. One of the things that we did was to analyze the various IT systems for our highest volume services. So in other words, if you look at the upper left hand area around about 10 o'clock on there, those pale blue, um, pale blue uh, boxes are all the different IT systems that are part of our council tax delivery. In other words, if you want to automate parts of council tax, you have to be prepared to engage with those seven different systems so that you can make it work all the way through. They're obviously on different scale, uh, but they're still a factor and they have their own procurement. So you'll understand the, the constraints that this can place on you and the fact that you have to be flexible and willing to build things a piece at a time. Uh, but it does, it is actually quite an eye an eye opening map and the services and IT were really quite interested to to see that. They go, Oh, okay, so now we understand a bit more about why it's not as straightforward as we thought. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to some of the uh work that we did. We took our highest volume uh transactions and we started to map their flows and as you can see we also applied some um some quantitative data to that. And then we used that to engage with the services around well if this is the case, what if, or why is, or is there something to be gained from doing this? And here's an example. We have an app that people can enter highways defects directly to, and that goes straight through to the right operative in the right place. 
But that's only a third of the incoming demand. Two thirds of it comes in via customer services who then type it straight into the app. So is the scope for channel shift here? What would that look like? Another one, um, we compare and contrast. So uh, applying for Streetworks, people apply for Streetworks for their Streetworks license online, but we don't publish it. So there's, there's, there's no online published information on Streetworks, which would naturally remove some of the demand coming in there. So that's, uh, again, that poses the question, if we're getting it online, why aren't we simply putting it out again? Here's passenger transport, one of my favorite of services. Uh, very high proportion of people apply by post, but then when they want to pay, some of them go by post and some of them go by phone, even though we have a very large you know, and an effective online payment route. And then I'm asking myself the question, what is the difference between post and, uh, and so, somebody no doubt will have a really good reason why this is, but what is the difference between post and online in terms of applying? What, what is the practical difference uh, in terms of making a valid application? Uh, this is a process that, that shows a two year journey. Uh, Garden Waste is a paid for service. Garden Waste Collection is a paid for service in Wiltshire. And this was our 2016 renewal. So this is for people who had taken out the service in 2015 and now wish to renew it. Uh, very popular service, but as you can see, a very large amount of demand coming in for post uh, phone and a little bit of face to face. Couldn't pay online. Um, and it occupied five customer services staff full time for three months. And actually, that post placed a really big load on customer service, which adversely impacted quite a lot of our other services through the through the phone lines. So we designed it. We redesigned it, and it's massively improved. And here is the new process. And of course, that looks terrible, doesn't it? This is all the wiring that sits underneath it. And the actual process I'll show you in a moment, but this is all the work that had to be done to make the, the garden waste service look like this to the customer. So that top row, all they have to do now is take a link in the email, enter their card details into a payment engine, and they're done. And that, then they get sent a, a sticker in the post that they stick on their, on their bin. You can see the channel shift has been colossal, 65,000. Uh, out of 85,000 now made their renewals by uh, by by web, and the majority was was uh, between the six and ten o'clock time slots when we our offices are closed, our phone lines are off, but that's when customers are customers to do this. So you can see there's a really big business and customer benefit from that particular example. We're anticipating similar kinds of improvements as we look at other areas. So turning our attention to the actual money stuff, um, this is how we went about calculating what the transactions were worth. And I, you know, we're well aware of Socketim's um, benchmarks. Our finance team were unconvinced by that because they wanted to have a more, um, uh, a more uh, robust um, business realization plan. So we worked out with them the, that what we would do is review the process end-to-end -end for each channel, which we had the information on because we'd done the process mapping, timed how long it took a member of staff to do that, and then you have the officer grade and cost per hour. Multiply that by the volumes, and that is what it costs you for the actual working time of the actual people who are doing those transactions on, you know, t taking an average time. Um, I want to show you how we've applied this to council tax. I'm not quite sure how clearly this will come out because I've done a PDF of a Vizio, so apologies for that. But if you look there, where the red ring has appeared, you'll see that we've split demand into moving house demand and uh, not moving house demand. And that 55,000 uh, 55, moving house queries resulting in uh, an, a new account being created on Northgate and 126,000, which were not a moving house query, but broke into various, various other demands. The, the next thing we did was we analyzed how those were coming in by channel. So you can see the volumes there, uh, the, the, the two broad types of transactions, moving house and everything else. Um, and then the channels, face-to-face, -face, phone, email, email, and web. Uh, and then face-to-face -face on, the, on, the, the on, the, on the not moving house. Uh, one other thing to show you there, again, interestingly, although the calls are meant to be rooted into uh, direct to council tax team, around about a fifth, first of all, coming through customer services. That raises a question, is that because people don't know? 
or is that because people can't get through? So that gave us something else to look at uh, and ask ourselves some questions about, which are not simply digital. And part of my part of my uh, kind of learning here has been that there will be things that you can do at the same time as you're tackling digital, which are just nothing to do with it. They're just simply a, a process choice that the organization's made that can change independently, entirely independently of anything that you want to do on the digital front. That will be one example, and I have another one later on. So anyway, here's the, the breakdown of transactions. And then on the next slide, you'll see the same transactions rolled forward with the processing time by the customer, the officer time, the elapsed time, how long it takes end to end, where the post is involved. And then we have the salary grades of the staff who are involved their hourly rate. And then when we aggregate all of that up, you'll see we have got a column towards the right hand side. Those that and I've put in bold, the three largest ones, um, moving house by email, we spend £92,500 on that a year, whereas we spend around about 250000 on phone calls. Well, if you count in customer services as well, nearly £300,000 on a whole bunch of phone calls to do with typically payment and queries. And then uh, emails, another 81000 on that. So that, that's where that, so those, those transactions are where the prizes are. The question is, how do you get into those and, and do something about them? And that is, that's, that's the point at which we reach. So we're doing more demand analysis now on those queries and started to look at options for ways to fulfill that. But this gives us a common base, a common uh, evidence set to discuss with the service when we're talking about what the benefits are going to be and therefore with finances to what the investment case is going to be. And that's a, then that's a joint thing between the program and the service area. Whereas one other thing I wanted to show you on this, um, and this is a, a different breakdown of the different, um, different channels for the same transaction. I want to know, notify you of change of address. And you see there that very tall column, 92,500 pounds for people emailing in. If people phoned or walked in, uh, they were dealt with directly by a member of the council tax team without involving anybody else. The volume of emails uh, coming in uh, has resulted in the council tax department having a member of staff who spend some of their time, not all of it, but some of their time allocating work. So they allocate bunches of emails to members, other people uh, doing processing. So that's uh, for email, it's a digital channel already. Uh, we're, we've introduced a person who is uh, allocating um, work. They're actually a more senior member of staff, so they're an M grade. Uh, and the cost of the allocation alone, just the allocation, is £11,000 a year. That was a byproduct of our investigation. And if, the, if council tax decide actually they could reallocate those resources, that's part of the, quest, uh, the, uh, the discussion with them. But they can change that without actually looking at digital at all. So as you analyze the transactions, you find quite a lot of things, some of which are, yes, this is going to be definitely part of our digital. Others are a byproduct or run in parallel and need not be. A change of address fascinates us in my team. Uh, we think it's a large prize, 55,000 a year from 210,000 households. And of course, it's not just council tax. It goes to four, five, six, eight, ten other places. Uh, those in, in practice then also create lots of opportunities for not just extra work, uh, but for errors. So the addresses are typically not right. So we are really interested in automating that end to end. We also think it's a, a useful mirror to the organization in terms of why is the work, why does the work work this way? Is it about the customer or is it about something else? I wanted to show you this. Uh, this is a, a journey of uh, um, a member of the public, and it's a five-year journey of this individual's efforts to get access to social housing. And we ran this, this actually, I think it's just over about nine or 10 years worth of interactions with the council uh, over that, and over that period, I'm just gonna skip forward. So here we go, now we're at 2013. And he's still going and he's still submitting bids and he's still coming into housing benefits and customer services. Um, and he just kept going and kept going and kept going. And by the time he got to the end, he'd done getting on for 300 interactions with three different service areas uh, and typically asked for a great deal of 
have been asked for great information which we already held in one place or another and bluntly it was passed from A to B. When we aggregated all of that we found that uh, this is the, the kind of the picture that we've got. Uh, so, you know, best part of 80 requests for advice, 80 to 85 requests for advice. Um, requests for proof, uh, you know, 35. This is this. I think we know this person by now, uh, and very large numbers of bids, and they're still not in social housing. And you'd ask yourself the question: What is, what's the return been on our in funding for this service? That would be one of the questions. Another question would be, I'd ask these, these questions. Are these three team services or structures? Is the work designed around the customer or around the structures? And then I think a really important question for digital, if we're going to do more than simply automate our existing services, how could we have done this differently? What, what opportunity does digital give us to rethink the way services work and also the organization is structured and managed? I'd argue that structures are simply means to manage work. They're not services of themselves, they're just means to manage work. And they reflect typically skill sets. Once those skill sets are incorporated into automation, you can look at different ways of managing the people who are there. And you can restructure the organization extensively. That I think that this ought to be on the horizon for our, our digital programs. So in, Summarising, um, how, how to achieve benefits from digital. Crucial, I think, is to redesign for value. Uh, I'd never want, we'd never want to automate waste steps, and we need a really good reason to automate um, demand, which didn't deliver value. If, so if it's waste demand, why would you automate it? Um, I think it's important to be open to rethinking the organisation. Uh, if you stop at a structure without following the, the transaction end to end all the way, you'll create artificial uh, breaks in the transactions and we will continue to manage uh, design processes around ourselves rather than around our customers. The information once it flows then you can do different and then coming on to the sort of the second last bullet we're already thinking about um, property as the public asset. Once you've got information flowing across organization boundaries in integrated processes then actually the processes and the staff can become sector assets rather than organization assets. Um, we see quite a large number of people across complex systems whose job is liaison, um, uh, basically making the system work across a boundary. If you've got an information flow, do you need quite so many? Can we release some of those resources into the value delivery rather than kicking the machine forward? And that kind of deduplication, because there is deduplication, um, is I think something which the public will be interested in seeing and that allows you to have a different conversation with the public around resources, capability and their part in this. Almost all of the digital work, uh, if it comes with a self-service tag, we're looking to the public to do co-delivery with us. They're providing information, and we're providing service. So uh, that's one step um, and, and a, 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 like a different, a different relationship with the public where they can see that we are making every possible effort to divert every penny to frontline rather than perpetuating existing boundaries is I think part of a, a discussion with the public around this is how we're trying to work with you but we need you to do this and it's a bit more balanced. Okay um, I'm I'm through all my slides uh, so and I'm more or less on time so very, very happy to take questions and do my best to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, John. That was really interesting. Um, so now there's time for some questions. Um, just to be reminded to everyone to ask questions, you use the little chat box um, on the panel on your right side. Um, so usually it takes a bit of time for the questions to come in. Um, I think Claire that is with us here from the Improvement Service has a question uh, for you, John. Yeah. John, I was just wondering, okay. I'm working with one of the uh, councils up here and we're interested in the council tax stuff that you were talking about. I know obviously you're just kind of starting there. Have you got any kind of plans on how you take forward integration and automation? The technical side, mm -hmm. did you say? Yeah, I have. I, the, the line wasn't brilliant. The, so the technical side, I, I'll be honest, I don't know very much at all about the technical side. Um, 
I, I know I know as much as I'm forced to know. Um, my you know my interest is in how do we make a transaction that will work for the customer. And, and our head of IT says, you tell me what it is you want, and we'll work out a way to make the information flow. Yeah. So uh, I, I can certainly put you in touch with people who do that side of things, but that's not my area of expertise. No problem. That's fine. I think it's, I if there's a, anything you've got on how you could uh, automate, that would be really helpful for us. Well, OK. I, I, that, I'm happy to. Um, we have a digital strategy and we've signed off a digital PID and um, those are both available, yeah. I think, said he confidently. Um, uh, and again, I think I'm very happy to put you in touch with people who, who do that side of things. Um, uh, let, me, let me know, you know, give me your email address and I can put you in touch with them. That would be great. Thanks very much, John. Um, okay, so at the moment we don't have any questions, but it usually takes a wee bit of time for them to come through, so we're just going to leave it a bit longer. Oh, here we go. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so we have a question here from Elaine, and she's wondering if uh, Wiltshire Council is using systems thinking out with digital service delivery. As well, uh, using, using system thinking as out with the digital service delivery. Outward, did you say digital yes, service? Can, can yes. you clarify the question? Um, I'm not really sure. Elaine, would you be able to send through a bit? Uh, yes. Yeah, so Elaine replied here with um, with public partners. Oh yes, I see what you mean now. You mean with people like police uh, and other partners? Yes, yes, we are. So we have a large uh, system-wide um, information program called Single View. So in short, the Single View of the customer, um, and that's got two strands. It, it's with police uh, and health partners, um, and it, the first strand is around sharing information at the point of use for. Uh, delivery. So uh, GPs can look up social care records when they've got the person in front of them, presentation of uh, social care information into A&E, uh, cross-referencing uh, mental health records with applications for uh, firearms licenses, um, and location of vulnerable people, which is uh, really important for people like fire and rescue and police um, and uh, you know, environment agencies who've got flooding or something like that. So that program is, is well established and well underway, uh, and we've got a number of pilot um, elements are up and running, right? particularly around GP practices and that kind of thing, but quite a lot in the pipeline. That's the first strand. The second strand uh, is to use business intelligence uh, to start to work out the, the, the most vulnerable and the people that in most difficulty um, are often those who are not uh, well, let, let's so, let put it this way. People who are um, fully supported already, they're in the system and they're set. But we think there's quite a large number of people who don't really meet a threshold, but they're, the current, they're not able to cope in the current system. Um, and so they're recurrent presenters at 999, A&E, maybe self-harm, uh, you, you name it. So we're interested in using business intelligence to understand what are the factors that typically precipitate people going from uh, coping to not coping, and then from there to work backwards and try and find the prevention strategies to address root causes. And that would all come out of that shared, that shared information. Um, you'd appreciate there's a substantial information governance challenge there, but we're working our way through it steadily. Okay, thank you very much for that, John. Uh, so we have another question come through here, and that is, how do you get buy-in from services like education and social work, um, as many of the services that you included here in the presentation were corporate? Well, yes. So uh, that depends, of course, which bits we're talking about. Um, For, my, for what it's worth, I think that very, very often, if, if you're dealing with a complex service um, that involves understanding an individual, I think it's hard to do that using digital. 
just my personal opinion. So that's not where I would start. However, there are an awful lot of elements of services which are bluntly really routine. So is it ordering equipment? Um, and some of the customers, for example, is that, is that, does that work like Amazon? One of, the, one of the ways that you can get teams like social care involved is to ask, what is it that stops your people spending time with their clients? How is it they spend their time and is it value adding? And what of this is repetitive work? Uh, so one of the ways that we introduce digital into our social services teams is actually to help them with mobile working because that effectively doubled their face-to-face -face time with clients, which is they viewed as being where they delivered most value. Um, the, on the education front, uh, then you've got things like school admissions uh, and so on, where uh, and probably they're automated already or they're largely online already. So it, it's, it's finding the points where you've got to offer and working with them on what they feel matters to them. And it, I, I, do, I do just think though that where it's a complex interaction, that's not the place to start with your digital program. Start with things which are simple and which you can make work. Hello? Yeah, hello, hello, John. Thank hello. you very much for that. Um, so I think that was the questions we had for you today. Um, Thank you very much, John, for taking the time to present today. Um, is there anything you would like to finish up on? Uh, no, only to say, uh, you know, thanks, thanks very much for the invitation. If if there's anything which I've covered which is of interest, the, the tools that we've we've developed, the approach, um, any aspect of that, very happy to chat with anybody about that uh, separately. So feel free to make use of our learning. Our leader has always been of the view that that the taxpayers paid for everything we've done. So we're very happy to share it if it's of any use at all. And I'm also interested to hear from other people, other councils who are at a similar stage or even slightly further ahead of us uh, in their journey to learn from them about what they've found is working in the digital area um, and what's been really important to making their journey work. So all of that would be great. Perfect. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, so just to finish off, uh, I have now brought up the Change Managers Network, uh, which you should all be able to see in front of you now. Um, we will post all the material from today on there and also on YouTube. Um, if you are not read, already signed up to the Change Managers Network, please do so um, because you get access to a range of useful resources and information from today uh, and other webinars and so on. So again, a big thank you to you, John, and goodbye, everyone. My pleasure. Thanks very much.